And we have the study is the first lesson this new quarter. The lesson study is titled How to Interpret Scripture. And for this lesson number one, this lesson is the unit of now. We're gonna uh, brief report again for what the prayer in particular lesson quarterly. Guide us and lead us, Lord. Give us wisdom and understanding so we can truly rightly interpret your word as well as understand your word. My prayer in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, let's go to 7 p.m. at March 28, 7 p.m. The page in your quarterly is page number six. Now then, Kiki. That's what I wanted to work on. All right, Sister Kiki, can you hear me? Yes, Pastor. If there are people that don't have a quarterly, what are we going to do? Uh, this is online. Uh, online. Let's get to our people. Can I make it lower? Mike is not. Can you tell people a quarterly? Can you tell people a quarterly? There's promotion going on, Pastor. There's too much commotion going yes. on. Unmute them, man. Too much commotion going on. People are not unmuting their mics. And we're hearing too much ruckus. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Hopefully, people will be sensitive to turn on their music, to turn off the music. I think the music they turn it off. Let's go forward and memory text. Let's all read the memory text together. Ready? One, two, three. Your word, Your word is a lamp, lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That's a scripture we should all try to memorize. That is a powerful scripture, of course. <laughs> and many of us know the song. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Great song. Good way to memorize the text. Psalms 119, 105. At this time, I'm going to ask um, you know, Brother Jeff to read that portion. Every you see what it says? Brother Jeff, you read it? Yeah, but uh, the picture is covering some of it. But use your quarterly. If you can't see all the time, use your quarterly. Oh, Because uh, I, my, my screen is clear. Just a little bit at the top and the side. Okay. okay. All right. Composed of, 60, composed of 66 books and written over 1,500 years on three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe, by over 40 authors. The Bible is unique. There is no other book, sacred or religious, like it. Another and no wonder, after all, it is the word of God. There are over 4,600 extant New Testament manuscripts from the first four century after Christ. Hence, we have powerful confirming evidence of the integrity of the New Testament text. The Bible was the first book to be translated and the first book to be so widely distributed in so many languages that it read by 95% of the earth population today. The Bible is also unique in its content and message. This focuses on God's redemptive acts in history. That history is intertwined with prophecy as it foretells the future of God's plan and his internal kingdom. Amen. Amen. So when we consider Bible, the word Bible really means a lot. For instance, in French, it would be bibliothèque. Is a word for library, bibliothèque. So the word Bible really means library. And so um, we were looking. At the Come on, guys! Stop the noise. Okay. 
here we see the Bible is 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. So it's a unique book just from that aspect alone. And to have the various writers, about 40 persons were moved by the Holy Spirit to down the words. But remember, the real author behind God's Holy Spirit. Amen? So that's why we say it is the word of God. Because God himself is the one who inspired men. Let's look to now uh, Sunday's lesson. Are you ready? Okay. Uh, the question says, in reading John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5, and in John chapter 1 verse 14, and John chapter 14 verse 6, what do these texts teach us about Jesus and eternal life? How does the word of word made flesh relate to the revelation and inspiration of scripture? Okay. Who can answer this question? We call Robert and Wilder. Can you give us an answer, Robert and Wilder? Yes, yes, Pastor. We're here. Yes, so let's get an answer to that question on Sunday's lesson. Yes. You know, John chapter 5 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 14 says, The Word was made flesh. What was the answer? What is the about Jesus' eternal life? Hold on, Pastor, you gotta say, um, Go to somebody else for now. Uh, no problem. Okay, let's say Lavelle. Lavelle, do you have your phone still on? Lavelle, your, your computer still on? Lavelle. Okay, I know. So then we'll go back to. Uh, well, that's my wife, Vicky. Vicky, are you still with us? Maybe she's doing breakfast. <laughs> 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 so, Sister Kiki, talk to me, Sister Kiki. <clears throat> Hello? No, these texts teach to life. Yes, Kiki, in answer the question. Okay. Oh, uh, the, according to this uh, particular Bible passage, it said the word made flesh. Is showing us that Christ has come to this world to show the, the example of the Father to us. Can you hear me? Say it again. I said the word made flesh. I think we are having problem because when you are not speaking, you're supposed to mute your uh, whatever, phone so that we won't be echoing each other. So I, okay. I can barely hear you. So what I'm saying yeah. is that the word made flesh show that Christ come to this world to show the example of the Father. So we'll be able to experience him ourselves. Okay. So here we see that's definitely the plan of God. Remember, the Bible says God with us, right? That's Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. All right. So here Jesus came in the flesh. He was truly Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, what does it teach you about eternal life then, Kiki? So, say that again, Pastor. What does it teach you about eternal life? What does this teach you about eternal life? Oh, this teach me about eternal life because Christ came to the world doing this example for us and uh, having his uh, horse following him and believing in him, it shows that we have eternal life if we trust in Jesus. Okay, so notice the living word of God. So here, when we have a Bible, it's a book. Is that true? Yeah. The Bible. It's a book. But then when we yeah. talk about Jesus, 
He is not a book, even though he's called the Word, but he's the source of inspiration of the Word. That Jesus is what the Bible or who the Bible revolves around. So Jesus is the source of that inspiration with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jesus means what? What does the name Jesus mean? Life. It means Savior. Savior. Yeah. Jesus means Savior. Let's move on. All right. And in regards to that. Yes. Jesus became flesh and dwell among God. So his desire is to have connection with us. So the scriptures reveal Jesus Christ to us. And the words speak to us is the word of God. And who is the word? Jesus Christ himself is the word. So the word, the word has life, given power. We are commanded to, to follow Jesus so that we can have this uh, internal life. So if we don't follow him, you don't have the chance of enjoying the internal life that Jesus is preparing for us. Excellent point. Excellent point. That is absolutely true. So we see the importance of not just being hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Yeah. Let's move on. And uh, Pastor, yes. so, so, and that is why uh, the word of God spoke to some of the prophet that eat the scroll. It's not saying they should eat the scroll literally, but they should internalize the word of God and apply it to their life to their behavior mm -hmm. and impart it to order. For example, mm -hmm. Ezekiel was asked to read, uh, eat the scroll. Jeremiah was asked to eat the scroll. Even John, the revelator, was asked to eat the scroll. So what they are saying in essence that we have, as followers of Christ, we have to internalize God's words, then apply it to our life so that we shape our, our, shape our behavior, how we relate to order, and at the same time, our behavior will draw other near to Christ. Next. All right, very good. Good point. Very good point. Because I don't want to eat paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move on. Um, we'll have Vicky read this passage there from Sunday's lesson. Okay. That's, do you all see it on Sunday's lesson? Yes. yes. Okay, go ahead, Vicky. Yeah. Yes. This is the focus and aim of all scripture. This coming in the flesh, yes, the Messiah was fulfillment of the Old Ten promises. Because he lived, died, and lives again, we have not only the scriptures confirmed, but even better, the great promise of eternal life in a whole new existence. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. 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 So here we see in the power. Powerfulness of Jesus being the focus and aim of all scripture. Remember, I like to say history is his story. True? Let's move on. Let's go to Monday's lesson. What do the following texts tell us about the biblical writers and their background? Now, we're not going to read all of this, but a wilder. Uh, Will, are you able to give us an answer now? Or, or Robert Colon, are you able to give us an answer? What was the question? Now? What was the one question? On the, screen. All right, the question is there on, on your book, It says, what do the following weeks, the Bible text you see on the words, Monday. on Monday's lesson, tell us about the Bible writers, the biblical writers, and their background. For instance, Exodus chapter 2, verse 10 says, that his name was called Moses because he was drawn from the water. Yeah. All right? Right. Okay. So, what you want me to go ahead? Moses' background, he was an adopted Jew into an Egyptian family of the royalty, right? So, he, he was of, of a royal background through adoption, not through birth. So, he was raised in the palace. That's Moses. A Jewish Egyptian raised in the palace, right? Yes, yeah, so, Pastor. Yeah, Pastor. So, so what he's saying that God used people from diverse um, backgrounds and uh, um, you know um, backgrounds and its diversity to write to use them to um, convey this message to the world in, in His Word. 
So they were led by the Holy Spirit from every background. You have Matthew, you have David, you have um, Jeremiah, Daniel, Moses, and they all came from different humble backgrounds. So somewhere like Moses, you know, he, he grew up in, in, in royalty, you know, and then, but then there were the other ones that the sheep bears, uh, God, like, like Amos. So he used these people um, and the prophets to, to uh, convey his message to the world. All right. So what we're seeing is that God is no respecter of persons. God can use anyone. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. That's right. We must just be willing vessels. Now that is in the writers about now. There's no more Bible writers. But God can raise up men or women to be prophets. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how many of you, by the sound of amen, are willing to be used by God, not to be a Bible writer, no. but to speak for God? In amen. 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 We need yeah. people yeah. and let people know the good news of the Bible. Right. Okay. Uh, this is an encouragement for all of us because uh, this is an encouragement. Yes, go ahead, Jay. This is coming to all of us. He's muted. Sorry, Pastor. Something else popped on my screen. Um, okay. Yeah, it's an encouragement for all of us because, that, that, you know, I've met many people and they say, you know, and they say, oh, I don't know what I can do for God or, you know, who am I? And, you know, we're minimizing ourselves, you know, when God has given us the authority by his word to share uh, Jesus with others and to share his word. Uh, if, in fact, thank you, Honor. If we remember that, remember the Holy Spirit is dwelling within us. If we truly believe that, then you know we we have a duty to be to share uh, uh, Christ with others. Okay, Yolanda, do you agree with your husband? Yes, I gave him some of that answer. Thank you. Okay, you good. Give so, you <laughs> very, very good. Let's move along. Okay. And um, Pamela, would you like to read that, Pamela? Read where, Pastor? On Monday's lesson, it says the very top quote, the Bible was written by people from many different kinds of background. Okay. The Bible, the Bible was written by people from many different kinds of backgrounds and in various circumstances. Some were writing from palaces, others from prisons, some in exile, and still others during their missionary journey to share the gospel. These men had different education and occupation. Some, like Moses, were destined to be kings, or like Daniel, to serve in high positions. Others were simple shepherds. Some were very young, others quite old. Despite these differences, they all had one thing in common. They were called by God and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write messages for his people, no matter when or where they lived. Also, some of the writers were eyewitnesses to the events they recounted. Others made careful personal investigation of events or careful use of existing documents. But all parts of the Bible are inspired. This is the reason why Paul states that whatever was written was written for instructions so that through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The God who created human language enables chosen people to communicate inspired thought in a trustworthy and reliable manner in human words. God has been pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies. And he himself, by his Holy Spirit, qualified men and enabled them to do his work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The okay. treasure was entrusted so, to Erden. So we, we see these important things that these people were all written or inspired by God's holy word. So even though he used yeah. people, 
there's really one author. Are we, are we all in agreement that? Yeah. One more. All right. So that's our confidence is that we have not believed cunningly devised fables. Let's look at these things here now. Okay. Like Allison to read this one. Allison, go ahead. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and he told the sum of the matters. Daniel 7, 1. So how did God communicate to Daniel? Dreams, visions, and dreams. I am dreams and visions. Then he says, then he wrote them down. So what we have in Daniel chapter 7, the entire chapter 7, is a record that Daniel wrote down of the dream and the vision that God gave him. So remember, it was God who gave Daniel the dream and the vision, and Daniel just wrote down what he saw. Remember, the Bible is not dictation. What is dictation, Francis? Word for word. What, the word for word, right? What so God did not give dictation. He didn't say, write this. He just gave him the vision. Then Daniel wrote down what he saw in vision. Are you all with me? Yeah. Let's go on. Let's look at the book of John. Now, here in the book of John, who was okay. John? John was one of the disciples. Oh, uh, he's one of the disciples. Did he, I, was he an eyewitness of the miracles that Jesus did? Yes. Yes. Did he hear, hear the words that Jesus spoke? Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. All right. So let's let's have somebody else read that one. Uh, let's get Len Len. Please read that for us, Len Len. Um. But, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. All right. So here, John was eyewitness. He was with Jesus. Now remember, this is not the next day. This is years after Jesus' uh, resurrection and years after his ascension back to heaven. Now, I know some of you have a good memory, right? Lennon, you got a good memory? Not so good. <laughs> so you need the Holy Spirit to bring things back to your remembrance too. Are you with me? I do. So we're looking at the importance of how God, years later, through the presence of the Holy Spirit, brought back the very words that Jesus said. So when John was writing his gospel and other things, right? He himself was of the Holy Spirit to bring things back to his members, members what Jesus had spoke years earlier. Did we see that? Mm -hmm. All right. So remember, John was eyewitness. Remember what Jesus said, but God brought it back to his remembrance, whatever he said to him. That's Bible inspiration. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Right, let's move on. Okay. Yeah. Let's have Kareem, six o'clock. Read that for us, please. Six o'clock. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in the book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Revelation chapter 1, verses 10 to 11. Okay, very good. So Jesus did not tell John what I tell you right in the book. What did he say? This is a call. He said to um that he's the beginning and the end. Right, but he said what what did he say afterwards? He right. said that make sure that he's, they send the message to the seven churches throughout right Asia before that though. To deliver a message. He said what so thou he, what? Well, yes, right. I am what thou seest, write in a book. Okay, so God gave him a vision. Remember, he was not an eyewitness in person, but God showed it to him in vision. While he was in the spirit, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and God showed him in vision. That's what's called vision. He said, what you see, write in a book. So God, John is just writing down a description of what he saw. Jesus did not tell him what to write. 
You see, this is Clark. Yes. All right. So there's John in vision. Jesus tells him, what you see, write in a book. So the book of Revelation mm -hmm. is really a revelation of what John saw through the visions that God, that Jesus gave him. Correct? Uh, right, right, right. Pastor, uh, one thing, uh, just, just to yeah, clarify, right. uh, Pastor, just to clarify, uh, what the pastor is describing uh, uh, the two types of inspiration. One is word inspired, where we quote uh, uh, God directly, word for word, verbatim. And then the other one that, that's being described is called thought inspired, where God doesn't say, write it exactly this way, but He, he allows us to, uh, to, not to interpret, but to, to write things uh, based on our education, our background, and the way we express it. Excellent. Thank you, Jay. So we have to understand the Bible we have is the Word of God, not the Word of God. Is it really said it? It's the Word of God. Well, that's not that's not one book. <laughs> that's the Word of God too. I was watching that, Pastor. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's inspiration too. Another type, right? So here we see the Bible. All right. Uh, was God breathed? All right, let's move on. We'll see more. Let's go here to Tuesday's lesson. Jay, why don't you read oh, you like to Yolanda? You like to read that for us, Yolanda? Tuesday's lesson. The Bible is prophecy. The Bible is unique among other known religious works because 30% of its content is comprised of prophecy. <laughs> Integration of prophecy and its fulfillment in time is central to biblical worldview. But God who acts in history also knows the future and has revealed it to his prophets. The Bible is not only the living word or the historical word, it is the prophetic word. Amen. Do you all see that? Yes. So here God is pulling things together for us. Remember, the Bible is not a dead word, okay? It's living, right? power. Let's move on, all right? And uh, we'll have Violet, where's Sister Violet? Are you there, Violet? I'm here, Pastor. All right, why don't you read that now, Sister? This is from Isaiah chapter 46, verse nine and 10. Isaiah 46, nine, 10. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. Amen. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Okay. So no one knows everything. Only God knows. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Right. Because from the right. end and uh, from the beginning to the end, God knows all. Praise the Lord for that, right? Yes. So when we yes. Talk about Amen. And we're looking at the Bible as prophecy in Tuesday's lesson. We see the following. Okay. Now then, Violet, how do the following texts reveal details of the coming Messiah? Pastor, can we take turns? And Use the general answer if you want to. Yes, you can help your mommy. <laughs> Genesis 49, 8 to 12, it, tell, it tells of uh, the coming of Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. Any others you want to take on? No. Don't worry, everybody. Violet is not in the airplane, okay? She's in the Bronx. She's not in the airplane. You see the airplane, Violet? But you know you're not in the airplane. Micah. Anybody else want to help her out? Sister Clark, you want to help her out? Or sure. Brother Jonathan or Kiki, you want to help her out? In, uh, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, he says, But thou, brethren, if thou shalt thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler in Israel. All right. Going so, forth and being old and for everlasting. So Jesus Christ is everlasting. No, but he's but, everlasting. But what is it telling about Jesus? Where was he going to be born? 
In Bethlehem, the of Judah. In Beth All right. So there we have a prophecy, a Bible prophecy, that the coming Messiah will come from which city? Bethlehem. Bethlehem, exactly. Yeah, the scripture says that. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Robert. Why don't you tell us, Robert? Give us one. He was Robert. born in Bethlehem. Exactly. Oh, that's what I was prophesying. Uh, that the Messiah will come from there. Oh, uh, Psalm 22, verse 12 and 18 shows the manner in which he is going to be killed. He was going to be surrounded by a whole bunch of people and he was going to basically be uh, killed by a mob. Okay, and, very good. Uh, also, it also Thank talks you. about how his clothes are going to be separated because at the, we know that when he was crucified, they casted lots for his clothing. Okay, excellent. So remember, this is prophecy. All right. Yeah, so years yeah. before, we talk hundreds of years before, God's Holy Spirit told these various Bible writers exactly in time. And he would be the Messiah. These are signs so we can know for sure who is the Messiah. So the Bible tells us God knows the end from the beginning. He's told us beforehand so we know that the one we call Jesus is the Messiah. Anybody else? Robert. Pastor. Yes. Then. Uh, in Zechariah 9.9, 9, said that the Messiah... It's going to be lowly, and he will be riding in a donkey. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, not, not comfortable riding, but, but that's a beautiful thing. God told us that Jesus is not going to come in a Mercedes. All the Amen. <laughs> right. No cars, Pastor. <laughs> right. <laughs> they didn't have cars back then. Right, All right, right. But we're saying, here it is. That the Bible told us that hundreds of years beforehand, and sometimes it was thousands of years beforehand, and so everything was fulfilled in time according to the will of God. Praise God! Yes. And just to clarify, yeah. just that, that occurred with his, in his triumphant uh, entry uh, just before Passover, before he was dying. Exactly. Exactly. What people would call Palm Sunday. Right. Right. But we see that the Bible said it, it happened. Let's move on. Okay. And let us have Sister Melanda. Are you there, Sister Melanda, still? Okay. If Sister Melanda's not there, uh, we'll call upon who else? Please read that from us. Melanda's there now. Hi, Sister Melanda, why don't you read that for us? That's Wednesday's lesson. That's on page number 10 in the quarterly. And it's the top paragraph. The Bible is unique when compared to other holy books because it is constituted in history. This means that the Bible is not merely the philosophical thoughts of a human being like Confu Confucius or Buddha but it records God's acts in history as they progress toward those specific goals. In the case of the Bible, those goals are the promise of a Messiah and two, the second coming of Jesus. All right, notice that there. So we're seeing that there. So here we're seeing as time comes to pass, the prophecies have been fulfilled and are fulfilled, but not only uh, in terms of Jesus' sight and it's coming, other things. Sister uh, Moji. I don't know the thing. How can I get that? Yes. Why don't you read us for us, say, from the Bible? Like it says, Bible or history of the Bible prophecy proved that we can trust the Bible's reliability. Here we see Babylon, right? Yes. Yeah. This is Moji. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the child. Chaldees, excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Isaiah mm -hmm. 19 to 19. All right, so there, right there, this emoji. The Bible's telling us, right, and prophesying that Babylon will never be inhabited again. All right, so here, after the Gulf War, all right, 
Babylon was there, but no one wants to live there from the time of the Bible because they think the place is haunted, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the Muslims don't want to live there. So it's now basically like like a walking museum. This is all Babylon. Basically a bunch of ruins, you know, that you could go and see ruins, but no one lives there. They think the place is haunted, right? Okay, so what the Bible said more than 2,500 years ago is still true today. Isn't that powerful or what? Pastor, doesn't it say, doesn't it say someplace also in the Bible that um, God does not leave his, or he always announces to his prophets what he's going to do beforehand? Exactly, because he wants us to be aware of what will happen in the future. Yeah. So, uh, why don't you read this one here, Elena, all right? This is about okay. Egypt. Okay. Okay, yet thus saith the Lord God, at the end of 40 years will I gather the people that they are scattered into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom, neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall no more rule over the nations. That's Ezekiel 29, 13 through 15. Okay, so today, is Egypt a superpower? No. All right. Egypt today is basically a third world nation. Yes. So it's no longer a superpower. It's no longer a major leading power. As the Bible said, Egypt would never be there anymore. So Egypt is just a third world nation. All right? Right, right. Now we go to this city. Can you, can you, can you bring back those, those texts again? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Ezekiel as well as uh, Isaiah? Yeah. There's Isaiah right there. Yes. Isaiah 13, 19 through 20. Yeah, Isaiah 13, verse 19 through 20. And the next one, Ezekiel. The other one there is Ezekiel 29, verse 13 through 15. <gasps> Oh, okay, thank you. Know and then now they Jonathan. I'm going to work on it. Jonathan, you want to read it for Brother Jonathan? This is about the city of Tyre. In the 6th century BC, Tyre, the proud Venetia, Western city, was one of the wettiest and most powerful seaport in the world. All right. Then what happened afterwards? Go ahead. Thus said the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, and they shall destroy the walls of, the, of Tyrus, and break down her towers, and destroy their pleasant houses, and they shall lay their stones in Antica, and thy doors the knees of the water. Ezekiel 26, 3, 4, 12. Now, here we see what the Bible said. Now, look what happened in the history of time. Okay, you want to read that, Sister Kiki? Okay, Pastor. 250 years after King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had destroyed the city of Tyre, Alexander, Alexander the Great came to the ruins of the old city of Tyre and discovered a new city grew up on an island have a mile from the shawl of the whole city. So look what happened. Mm. Alexander ordered his soldiers to take the ruins of the whole city of Tyre and build a causeway 200 feet wide from the mainland to the island city. All right, so remember the Bible said that that city of Tyre, the old Tyre, right? Yeah. Will be cast into the sea. Do you remember the Bible said that? Mm. Like, where was that? Where was that? Timber, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha. And timber and the dust uh, in the midst of the water, right? That God would do it. They shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust in the midst of the water. That's what the Bible prophesied, right? So Nebuchadnezzar, one of the people, destroyed Tom. Alexander now, because he had no navy. He decides, I'm going to attack that city out there. So he took the whole city, the rocks, the dust, everything, timber, threw it in there to make a land bridge. A causeway is a land bridge. 
all right? And so he made that land bridge, a causeway, like a dam, going from the mainland across to the island. And therefore he attacked the city and conquered Tyre. Is that powerful or what for Bible prophecy? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? So here the Bible says that it will be cast into the sea. And so what happened? Alexander, not knowing what the Bible said, he went and what? Cast the old city of Tyre into the water, into the sea to get to the, the island where they built a new city. They feel good. They are fortified by all this water. Nobody will attack them. But God's word will prove true all the time. Isn't that powerful, everybody? Amen. Amen. Therefore, we can trust the Bible. We can trust God's word without question. Amen. Let's move on. Here we have that temple in Jerusalem. Now, Jesus made a prophecy. There's, what did Jesus say? Yes, I'm not the one thrown upon another that shall not be thrown down. Okay, that's what Jesus had prophesied. Then, Matthew 24, verse 2. Vicky, why don't you read this here? Look what happens. Here is um, Emperor Titus. He goes into Jerusalem. He destroys Jerusalem. And here, the Arch of Titus, there in Rome, you go to Rome today, you can see this triumphal arch. And there is what uh, furniture is that they're carrying? I mean, you can tell me what that furniture is? The lampstand. The lamp. The lamp. Yeah. Seven brass candlestick. That's right, the lampstand. Seven so Here, that's from the temple, isn't it? Yes. What part of the sanctuary is that lampstand that is featured? Holy place. Holy place. The, the holy place. place. The holy place. Very good, Henry. That's the holy place. So here we didn't find the Ark of the Covenant. That was in the most holy because that was hidden away, right? But here, uh, Titus destroyed the city and the temple, just like what Jesus said. There will not be left what one stone upon another. So look what happens, everybody. As uh, says, history, the hand is stamping history. It says, "What well, fulfilled, fulfilled, fulfilled." Bible prophecy: Babylon fulfilled, Egypt fulfilled, Ty fulfilled, Jerusalem fulfilled. Amen. That gives us confidence that the Bible can be trusted. The Bible is a Bible of prophecy and history, and so we see that history just fulfills Bible prophecy. Can we say praise the Lord? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Pastor. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I want us to know also that the Bible is completely not true. In spite of the fact that some people are doubting some of the history in the Bible. But the irony of it is that unfortunately, they don't even, they are doubting some of the history in the Bible, but they don't doubt the history of Caesar. They don't doubt the history of Alexander, the believer. And that's what prompted the archaeologists to go into a lot of discovery. But the good news is that no archaeologist discovery has ever contrib contradicted the Bible. So the Bible is pure and complete. The histories are true. Amen. Thank you. So read this about archaeology now. There you go. Historical statements of the Bible are accurate, as we just said. But now look at it. Go ahead, brother Jonathan. The more the, the Moabite stone carved by Moabite scribe around 800 BC tell tales of the deeds and wars of King Mesha against the kings of Israel. Second Kings three four to five. And Mesha, king of Moab, was the chief master and rendered unto the king of Israel an hundred thousand lands and a hundred thousand rams with a wool. But it came to pass when Ahab was dead that the king of Moab rebelled. I can't say the last, the last against time. the king of Israel. So here it is, Brother Jonathan, just like you said, archaeology now. This is not a Jewish writing. This Moabite stone is a record of the Moabites and of their war against the king of Israel. He meets his war against the king of Israel. So that's their history on that piece of rock. And in the Bible talks the same thing. Like you said, archaeology uh, um, reinforces the Bible. 
This is Henry. called the Rosetta Stone. Henry, Henry? Yes. I want you to read this about the Rosetta Stone. Go ahead. The Rosetta, Rosetta Stone, now in the British Museum, became the key to the long forgotten language of ancient Egypt. On the stone is carved a decree of Ptolemy the fifth of Epiphanes, the king of Egypt from 203 to 8, um, 181 BC. The first inscription is, is in Egypt, Egyptian hieroglyphics. The second is Demotic, what? Demotic Egyptian, the proper language of Egypt at the time. At the bottom of the stone is the same message written again in Greek. Okay, so this Rosetta Stone, Henry, became a key to, to unravel the mystery of hieroglyphics. People didn't know what these symbols of birds and flowers and angel objects were. But once it was written in Greek, they used the Greek to decipher the other languages. So all of the inscriptions of now became revealed and so they now can use that to substantiate as brother jonathan said stories in the bible is not powerful or what so here we're seeing history once again and archaeology has proven the bible true okay um who can i have to read this here with this one here who would like to read this one about the synagogue of nebuchadnezzar maybe vicky why don't you read this one all right you have these things here Bel El Amarna tables. All right, these are other stones like the cylinder of Nebuchadnezzar. You have also what? Dead Sea Scrolls. All right, Dead Sea Scrolls, as we read in the beginning, are portions of the Bible. All these uh, existing copies of the Bible that shows us the Bible has not been altered, like the Muslims want to say. That shows the Bible is reliable and trustworthy and has not been altered or changed. But we have truly today the infallible word of God. How many of you believe the Bible is infallible? Say amen. 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 Trust the Bible. Okay, so Brother Jonathan, why don't you read that? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. I saw you fly in there prove that the Bible can be accepted as a reliable, you can see the rest, Pastor. Historic facts. So archaeology proves, right? As you just said, Brother John, remember? Yes. So archaeology proves that the Bible can be accepted as a reliable source of historical facts. Yes. Praise God for that. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's move on. So here we have those, Vicky. We said the Rosetta Stone, the Moabite Stone, the Cylinder of Nebuchadnezzar, right? The Tablets, the Dead Sea Scrolls, the state of the archaeologist proves the Bible's reliability. Okay, let's go to Wednesday's lesson, everybody. Wednesday's lesson. We're looking oh, at 10. Are you all with me? Oh, Eight, pastor. Pastor, just one comment before you yes. um, it, it, it's very interesting that, that there was a newfound interest in archaeology about the same time that uh, William Miller started preaching his end time message so uh, very true through, uh, when when and also at the same time when um, Darwin started the foolishness of uh, evolution uh, the Lord put impressed my souls to have a uh, new farm interest in archaeology to disprove all those things that absolutely it's true true uh let me call jason i see jason on the couch jason you want to read that question for us or jason all right pastor i heard enough um, go ahead jason that's on wednesday's lesson Okay, maybe you come close to the mic. We can't hear you. What do these patches <laughs> about? Not only, not only the. It told me to go to the. Can't get for us personally. All right, thank you, there, Jason. 
So help us answer the question then. I, I know you have it there, but who can answer the question for us? Can you answer Len Len or anybody else? My answer that I wrote here is that um, the goal of the Bible is actually to um, tell us to lift Jesus, Jesus coming, his death and resurrection. So that is like the whole goal of the whole Bible altogether. Okay. All right. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I take a shot at it? Yeah, go ahead. It, it also... Um, Historically, it, it, the Bible tells us that Jesus was resurrected. So as Christians, we know that we will be resurrected as well. So we have right, that. Beautiful. Keep on going, Violet. Oh, um, um, that's it. Okay. And there are eyewitnesses also. There are eyewitnesses also that Jesus Christ resurrected. Just like in 1 Corinthians 15. It says that Cephas and the others have seen that him um, got resurrected. We, they see him after his resurrection. So that's, that's like if we believe the Bible, that is something for us to hold on to, that Christ did really resurrect, and therefore our resurrection, if we believe in him, will be sure. Okay, so Vicky's Vig saying, it's similar to what Violet said and, and others, that Christ's resurrection gives us hope that we too, when we come to our last day, it will not be the end. We're hearing about thousands who have died from this coronavirus, but the hope we have is in the resurrection. Because Christ rose, then those who have died in Christ will also rise. Amen. I remove fear from our minds at this time. Do you all feel the same way? Amen. Amen. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Okay. We in Thursday, and now we go to Thursday's lesson. All right, that's page number eleven. Okay, the transforming power of the word. Okay, and who would like to read that passage for us? In six twenty one BC, when Josiah was about twenty five years old. Helikiah, the high priest, discovered the book of the law, which may have been the first five books of Moses, or specifically the book of Deuteronomy. During the reign of his father Amun and his most wicked grandfather Manasseh, the scroll had been lost in the midst of the worship of Baal, Asherah, and all the hosts of heaven. In 2 Kings 21, verses 3 to 9. As Josiah hears the conditions of the covenant, he tears his clothes in other distress, for he realizes how far he and his people have come from worshiping the true God. He immediately reigns a reformation throughout the land, tearing down the high places and destroying images to foreign gods. When he is finished, there is only one place left to worship in Judah, the temple of God in Jerusalem. The discovery of the word of God leads to conviction repentance and the power to change okay so notice it says the lesson's title what the transform transforming power of the word okay. so how does the bible assure us that it has the power to change our life and show us the way to salvation Denise, can you answer that question for us are you there Denise? Okay, you can answer. Okay, remember, we're seeing how when Josiah, a young man, just 25 years old, when he had the word of God read, probably the book of Deuteronomy, his heart was changed and right away called for what, everybody? Revival. 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 What else? All the altars. The altar. Reformation. Reformation. Yeah. All right. So, by the way, the Bible is not a dead book, it's a living book. When a person reads the Bible, it transforms their life. If the Bible does not impact your life, then you are not a believer. Right. That makes sense, everybody. Yes. If the Bible does not change your life, you are not a believer. Because the Bible cannot allow you to remain the same. 
So Elena, right. answer that question for us, Elena. What do these passages teach us? Uh, uh, what do these passages teach us about not only the historical of Christ's resurrection, but what it means for us personally? Elena, you okay. It means that um, if we are new creatures, we really are new creatures in Christ. Different things happen to us. We think differently. We speak differently. We want souls to be saved. A whole different package happens to us mentally, physically, and spiritually. Okay. First, I think you went to screen backwards. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I did go back, didn't I? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you there, Violet. So, uh, thank you, Violet. I didn't realize I pressed the wrong button. Now you know I'm a <laughs> techno savvy. <laughs> thank you for pointing it out. Uh, why don't you read a question for us then, Violet, please? Okay. How does the Bible assure us that it has the power to change our life and show us the way to salvation? So help answer the question now. Uh -huh. Well, from from the um, from the the passage that we just read with when Hulka found the the, the book, uh, it, it's an effect that it should have on us that when we when we read uh, the word, as the Bible itself itself says that the Bible is sharper than any two-edged sword, and if we are led by the Spirit, we should be changed when we read the Word of God and change to action so we should have faith and believe in his word in his words but then faith without works is dead so we are to act on whatever the word tells us because as we as um, sister elena just read when uh the kings um got the book and it was read by shafan he was moved right away to to change whatever um bad things that were done he started tearing down the idols and he proclaimed a prayer and a fast he immediately saw what was wrong and moved towards it so that is how we should do it when we read the word of god uh if it, well it should apply to us and we should not carry or or we should make haste to make the necessary changes in our lives okay so i like somebody to give a very short testimony very short testimony how the bible has impacted your life and has transformed your life anybody is bradley there bradley you there Mm -hmm. All right, if Bradley's not there, who else is there? I'd like to give a little testimony, short testimony, how the Bible has transformed your life. Anybody? Well, because, like, for example, it says we steal and stuff like that. If, um, for example, you go into a store and they're not charging you for something, you go back and you tell them, hey, you didn't charge me. So honesty is um, something right. that I see has happened to me that when they don't charge me, I will tell them you know, okay. in a store. That's a small example. Well, it's an example. It's a true example. Beverly, what about you, Beverly? Has the Bible changed you? Uh, is the Beverly? Yes, thank you. All right, Beverly's not here. Uh, anybody else like to share how Bible has transformed your life? Thank you for the comment, Elena. Anybody else? You're welcome. I can say for me personally, before I really came to Christ, I was 22 years old, I used to use profanity quite often because it's like being cool, being you know, tough, using profanity. But once came, God came in my life, I stopped using curse words. I stopped using profanity. And so it changed my whole language, my whole tone, my whole lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Really, the word of God had power in my life. And by the way, everybody, it's still changing me now. Amen. Okay? <laughs> Yeah. That is not through changing me. Anybody else want to give a short testimony? For me, the Bible has changed my um, lifestyle and like my dressing. Before, I didn't really care what you know i would wear and if it's you know kind of revealing and stuff like that but you know when i started reading the bible i 
and realizing, you know, this is the temple of God and I should multiply uh, the way I present myself to God and especially like to other people. So in the way of doing, I definitely, um, you know, the Bible had changed. Amen. Praise God. Let me get one more testimony. Anybody else? One more testimony. Pastor, uh, yes. Sister Maxine. Um, hey, Sister. Hi. I've been listening, but I have a lot of, a lot of noise in the background sometimes. I, I have to keep it on mute. All uh, right. The Bible has changed me in a way that um, teaches me that I have to live by examples. Because if I don't, like Sister um, Dina said, uh, the way you dress, the way you carry, um, your character should reflect the very um, example, example of Christ. So that you, whatever we do, it, 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 it doesn't only affect us, it ex affects everyone that knows us, that uh, loves us. So uh, whatever we do, if it's not feasible to God, then um, it's, it's not the right example that we're setting. So it teaches me that um, the example that I set, my, um, they are, uh, my children will follow, my family will follow, my, everybody who I impact, have an impact on will follow um, through right examples. All right, very good. Thank you, Sister Maxine. Okay, we'll just finish up right now. And Brother Jonathan, why don't you wrap up there with this testimony of further thoughts? Go ahead. Say that again. Oh. We're wrapping up the final lesson. For final part. Many have died for upholding our many faithful to the word of God. One such man was William Taylor, an English tourist minister who resisted the imposition of the Catholic Mass during the reign of Bloody Mary in his Catholic, England, Paris. After being cast out of the church and derided for his adherence to scripture, he appealed in person to the Bishop of Winchester, Lord Chancellor of England, but he had, he had him cast into prison and eventually sent him to the stake. Just before his death in 1555, he spoke this word. Good people, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word. And those lessons that I have taken out of God's blessed book, the Holy Bible, I have come here this day to seal it with my blood. Okay, and that's taken from the Martyrs Book of Martyrs. Here we see a person was willing to lay down their life. So we've got to think about the Bible, take our life, even if it costs our life. Stand up for truth, stand up for Jesus. 